Well, thank you. Uh, my name is John Yo. I'm a PhD student at Oregon State University in Corvallis. And uh, I'm working with uh, the collaborators here are Dan Sullivan in the Crop and Soil Science Department, and then Jerry Weiland and Dave Bryla over at the USDA Agricultural Research Service. And I came into this program wanting to solve a significant problem in agriculture. And Phytophthora arose its ugly head. And I've been working on this for about two years now. Um, Let's just to start with the pathogen here. It's Phytophthora cinnamomy. So it comes from the Greek, the word phyto and thora, which means plant destroyer. And this particular plant destroyer was named after the host who was first found on uh, cinnamon trees in 1922 in Southeast Asia. And since then, with the globalization and human activity, we've slopped it all around the world. And it's uh, pretty much everywhere has many, many hosts. I've read 900 hosts in one publication. And the primary economic host of importance is avocado worldwide. And then recently, there's been a lot of blueberry expansion with the nutraceutical movement. And everybody loves blueberries, right? So blueberry production has expanded worldwide. Uh, a lot of it's going under drip irrigation because of the ability to fertigate. And uh, we are starting to see higher levels of disease under drip irrigation than under sprinkler irrigation. So on blueberry, it can be a pretty significant pathogen. On the left here, we have a uh, non-infected plant. On the right, we've got an infected plant. And you can just see the growth difference. And uh, here's a little bit of data generated showing the relationship between growth reduction and uh, root infection incidence. So root infection incidence in the bottom and then uh, this is root growth reduction and then above ground growth reduction. And it's pretty significant, substantial. Uh, let me just explain this figure real quick. We've got it split down the center. The top two rows are roots from infected plants and the bottom two rows are roots from non-infected plants. And then within each line, this is a different cultivar. So some cultivars, some cultivars are more resistant than others. And unfortunately, many of the ones that are favored for fruit quality characteristics, such as Duke and Draper, are these ones in here that just melt when they have Phytophthora. So this is the, the data from that these previous roots. Um, so even the more resistant varieties, taller bars equals more resistant. Uh, green is above ground growth and purple is root growth. So even the more resistant varieties, <clears throat> uh, still we're looking at 50% growth reduction. Aurora here seems to, for some reason, didn't have any above ground growth reduction in this cultivar screening. But uh, Duke, and Drape, Duke and Draper are amazingly susceptible. Liberty is a little bit, uh, a little bit more resistant. And then for diagnosis of the disease, you know, it's a root disease. You, know, you can't really see things under the soil. And so you start to rely on foliar symptoms. The leaves turn very red, flaming, flaming red, and then start to die. I see reduced plant vigor. And what the symptoms are really showing is a dysfunction in the vascular system of the plant. So we're, um, that could be caused by irrigation failure, clogged emitters, broken lines, rodent disease. Um, blueberries will turn different shades of red depending on nutrient deficiencies. So amongst in, in there, you have to decide you know, if, if you really have root rot disease or not. Next thing you do is you get out the shovel and start digging. And what you'll really see is the healthy plant over here has very light colored roots, many fine fibrous roots. The infected plant, the roots are very dark, uh, not very many fine roots. Uh, another prominent feature is the abundance of whips. Whips are regenerative basal shoots on blueberries. And we have lots of whip formation over on this uh, healthy plant and really no new regenerative growth on the non-infected plant. Uh, next thing in the diagnosis process is to confirm presence of the pathogen. Luckily, it's Phytophthora cinnamomy is really easy to grow on artificial media. We can use um, PARF, which is contains antibiotics to suppress the other microbes growing. And then Phytophthora cinnamomy has a very distinctive hyphae, very tightly branched and coralloid, uh, non-septate. 
And then we also have molecular techniques for detecting Phytophthora cinnamomy, but they can often be very sensitive. They'll give a positive, but then there's no way you can isolate from that. So it would be great if you want a really, really robust test, I guess. Uh, so getting into control, we got to think about the biology of the pathogen a little bit. It's an omycete, it's a water mold. I think it's dubbed a water mold because the um, zoospores are released under saturation. So, um, so it's got filamentous non septate hyphae, and then it's got cellulose in the cell walls. Phytophthora di differ from the true fungi. True fungi have chitin in the cell walls, and this uh, cellulose is, can be important from a management perspective, which we'll get to. And it's a heterothallic phytophthora, meaning it has to have two mating types within one region to come together and produce oospores. But luckily in most regions, they only have one mating type. And then the chlamydospores are a survival mechanism that allows it to persist in the soil for a red up to six years, maybe longer. And then the really cool spores are the zoospores. And zoospores have these little flagella and they can kind of like wiggle around and swim through the soil solution. And they uh, sense the amino acids being released from roots. And depending on the amino acid profile, uh, that's one way you can get cultivar um, resistance if it's not uh, exuding the amino acids that are recognized by the pathogen. So uh, getting into disease management, uh, first thing is exclusion. Phytophthora management really starts in the nursery. Uh, once a nursery has Phytophthora, it just gets slopped around everywhere. Um, site selection, well-drained soils, cultivar selection, uh, it's really imp important for organic growers. The southern highbush blueberries uh, have been reported to be a lot more resistant to Phytophthora, but in the literature, I see lots of reports of Phytophthora in southern highbush growing regions, so it's still a problem despite the uh, enhanced cultivar uh, resistance. And uh, we do have chemical controls available. And then uh, I'm going to have done some work with calcium and cellulase we're going to talk about in a second. So first of all, I know this is the organic conference, but for the agronomists who drink fungicide for breakfast, we've got um, Ritamil Gold, which is uh, methanoxum. And this is a target's RNA polymerase. It's pretty nasty stuff. It's uh, applied directly to the soil. And um, there is a high risk of resistance. If I talk through a, I've heard maybe two or three years of repeated applications and you can start getting resistance to develop. Uh, we also have the phosphonate fungicides. Aliette is one. And these are foliar applied systemic fungicides that um, have multiple modes of action. First of all, the phosphonates are directly toxic to Phytophthora. And B, the, uh, the phosphonate enhances the level of an enzyme in the propanoic acid pathway and creating, um, causes the creation of uh, phenolic compounds that are uh, inhibitory to the pathogen. So for blueberry production, we, uh, it's recommended that blueberries are grown on raised beds to enhance the soil drainage and aeration. And sawdust mulch is commonly applied for weed suppression. And we'll talk about, a little bit about mulch in a minute. And then also sometimes on heavier soil sites, sawdust is actually incorporated into the soil, so tilled in before the raised beds are formed. Uh, so we have this concept of the ash burner suppressive soils. This guy, uh, an Australian farmer, Guy Ashburner, had an infested avocado orchard with Phytophthora cinnamomi. And then adjacent to his orchard was, was the forest. And he noticed that even though there were susceptible hosts in the forest, his orchard looked terrible and the forest was still growing healthy. So he wondered, what is it about the forest soil that's not conducive to the pathogen? And like any good farmer, he started mulling things over and decided he would try mulch and calcium application. And he was successful. He recovered his, his orchard, apparently. And this uh, ash burner suppressive soils have been uh, sort of a case study that have been looked at by many researchers. And sort of the uh, underlying conclusions that people have come up with is it's mulch and calcium. Uh, well, I guess we'll get to the conclusions in a second, but the system is mulch and calcium. And I wanted to look at, can we apply the ash burner system to blueberry production? So cellulase is an enzyme. Um, cellulose is in wood, 
It's also in the cell walls of, phy of the phytophthora. So when a, we got to think about how a microbe eats, right? They don't have mouths to put food in. So what they do is they release all these extracellular enzymes, right? Cellulase. They put it out there. And then the cellulase works, chopping up those 1,4 beta-glucosidase bonds in the cellulose, sucks it all back in and absorbs those glucose units. And it's been shown in the literature that increasing levels of cellulase activity can cause lysis of the phytophthora hyphae, uh, decreased sporangia production, and also decreased sporangia viability. So we're attacking the hyphae and the sporangia here with um, cellulase. And uh, so produced by microbial decomposers in the soil. And then the mode of action for calcium to suppress phytophthora is it's a specific ion toxicity to the zoospores. So these little motile zoospores that are swimming around in the soil solution, we hit them with enough calcium, and all of a sudden, boom, they insist. But then they subsequently germinate. And zoospores don't really have many reserves, and so they can only grow a little bit of hyphae. And if there's no root next to it, then that's just gone and dies, and that dispersal agent is not going to disperse. So the problem is we need to find a source of calcium without raising the pH and without increasing the salinity to a level that's uh, too high for blueberries. And so with gypsum, gypsum is calcium sulfate and therefore does not raise the pH. Sulfate is the conjugate base of a strong acid and therefore when you put it in soil, it never forms the equilibrium. It uh, doesn't change the pH, but it does can have slightly high electrical conductivity, which is how we measure salinity in soils, uh, about 2.6 decisiemens per meter if you saturate the soil with gypsum. So it's not way beyond the levels of plant growth, but it's sort of approaching the upper limit for blueberries. So I ran a greenhouse experiment testing out five different organic residues, the theory of adding organic matter to enhance the cellulase activity. I uh, tested peat, which uh, theoretically would have no, no cellulase uh, inhib er, uh, promoting effects, sawdust, aged bark and compost, or sorry, aged bark plus biosolids compost, dairy solids compost, yard debris compost. I tested each one of those composts with and without gypsum, and then also all of that with and without phytophthora. And uh, we also had a phosphonate soil drench control. Let's get into the results here. So got my um, treatment one is uh, soil only control. Seven is soil with gypsum. Uh, so one through six, the various organic matters, two through six, uh, two and eight would be the same organic matter, but without gypsum and with gypsum. So all the gypsum treatments had significantly less root infection than the gypsum treatments than the non-gypsum treatments. So we, we were getting some suppression out of the gypsum. Um, and then the above ground growth, the blue bars are non-infected plants, the red bars are infected plants, and again, we have the no gypsum and gypsum. So without gypsum, none of the, or, none of the organic residues really provided any disease suppression. All these red bars are pretty low growth. Over with the gypsum, there wasn't really an interaction with the organic matter, but again, we conclude that the gypsum did help plant growth. If we look in, in the infected plants, if we look at the non-infected plants, the blue bars here, it looks like gypsum slightly decreased plant growth, and I attribute that to the salinity effect. Um, root growth is a similar story. The red bars here are taller than the red bars there, so we have uh, some disease suppression from the gypsum really no effect from any of the composts. And then science is supposed to be repeatable, right? Well, I tried to repeat the results in the greenhouse and failed miserably. I think my um, disease level was too high and all the plants kind of melted. And additionally, I was uh, starting this in the fall and trying to push them through the winter in the greenhouse, but I think they were going into dormancy. So I didn't get any good results from the repeat of that experiment. And so now I just put in a field trial testing out gypsum. Uh, we're also testing out sawdust mulch versus geotextile mulch, wide drip lines versus narrow drip lines. So this is the same, uh, same field experiments, different uh, angles. We'll have the results of that in a couple of years. 
And so I guess the conclusions I can make from this is gypsum might be promising for blueberries uh, for reducing Phytophthora incidence. It also could reduce growth if you uh, don't have Phytophthora. And I didn't get any results from the compost. So thank you very much.